happy Thursday. Welcome to a Chair League Division 3 of Palooza. We have back to back to back to back Chair League Division 3 games for everybody's enjoyment this evening. We're just about to get game one going right now. We are going to be on Infernal Shrines for game one. This is uh, Cole Slot's map selection and House of Chez will have the first pick, first ban. House of Chez has been around Chair League since season one. They went two and three in season one, five and seven in division two, in season two, and in division three, four and three last season. Back in division three, struggling so far at 0-2 as their opponents, Cole Slot, um, excuse me, Cole Slot, also 0-2. So one of these teams is going to get their first win of Season 4 tonight. Looks like we have almost all of House of Chez in here. Waiting for one more. And then we will get Cole Slot into the lobby and get this show on the road. I uh, I really enjoy casting Division Three. It's the most casual of all the divisions in Chair League. Um, however, it's also the most fun. It's uh, not quite as meta as some of the higher level divisions, so you're never really going to know what you're going to get. I've seen some really good play down here and uh, some really interesting strategies as well, so always looking forward to that. Should be good times. All four of our games tonight our best of one, so one game sets, and uh, in 40 minute slots. So we should really be hammering right through uh, these games. Very little downtime. And uh, have plenty of action to watch this evening. I will say as a caster, I'm very happy that uh, that they have the in-client drafting. Because it makes this game so much more fluid without having to use third party uh, sites and draft links. Everything just goes much, 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 much smoother, which is fantastic. So we have both teams in lobby. I just want to make sure that we have the right banners. And then we will get this show on the road. I'm really excited for this particular week. We had a big patch on Tuesday. Murky now one of the top win rates um, according to Hot Slogs. And um, sorry, I was distracted by some administrative stuff here. Murky, at, uh, toward the top of the win rates now, he's a lot of fun. He's very powerful. And of course, uh, Lucio is now in the Nexus and available to be selected. Uh, generally regarded as pretty strong. And we are officially going to be underway <coughs> so house of chess has first pick first ban they have selected to ban opted to ban mouth probably still the top overall healer in the game uh, very highly contested almost always goes uh, early in the draft, certainly before second ban. And that's not a particularly surprising ban, especially on Infernal Shrines, 
where his uh, area of effect zoning control with the roots is very powerful. Ragnaros also very powerful and very highly contested. On Infernal Shrines, his Molten Core is really excellent in defense, and he will be the ban for Coal Slot. Artanis, first pick for House of Chez. He's an excellent off-tank bruiser, does good damage, very, very durable. Uh, for a tank, he's a little light in the peels department, but that long-distance swap can really lead to some big, big plays. Um, both of his ultimates are pretty solid as well. But it's really that long-distance swap that makes him a highly prioritized playmaker in the meta right now. Cole Slot responds with ETC and Ariel. ETC, probably the best overall primary tank. Does so many things well. Ariel needs a, needs a good battery as a healer. She is, of course, dependent on the damage that her team does. So she needs a battery to power her properly. So you want to get somebody like a Lunara or a Gul'dan, uh, a Vala, to make sure that she has the heals that she needs. Thank you, Jstad. Let me know if that's a little bit better. Waiting for the choices here for House of Chez. Vala always very good. Her Q build is particularly good uh, on this map and Battlefield of Eternity. Brightwing, solid healer, excellent global, good CC with the Polymorph. Coleslot responds with a Tassadar ban. Tassadar is so good with Vala, so that's a really solid, solid ban. Now House of Chez has to make their selection for the second ban of their of uh, this draft here. The Tychus ban is what they're showing now. Wouldn't be surprising at all. You have to figure they're going to select a second tank to pair up with Artanis. And Tychus really does a nice job of really putting the hurt on the front line. Uh, just a good hero overall. Both Commandeer Odin and the Drill Laser are uh, good in the right situation, so banning the Tychus here would make a lot of sense. And it looks like that's the direction House of Chez would go. Cole Slot has now two selections to make. I would imagine this is the place we're going to see the Ariel battery. Kael'thas is excellent on Infernal Shrines, as is Gul'dan, so I wouldn't be surprised to see either one of those heroes come out. Lunara, uh, not quite as common as those two, but she also is a really nice Ariel battery. Really any high damage hero that does consistent, steady damage to power up that Ariel goes great with her. If you really want to go a little crazy, Cho'Gall in particular does really well with Ariel, although I, I don't think we would see that for sure. Sixteen seconds left. They're really taking their time here. Uh, if I am Cole Slot, I'm looking at probably my off tank or melee assassin and whoever I want to power up that Ariel. And then you leave that kind of fifth pick as a nice flex pick to respond to whatever House of Chez does. Instead, they opt to go double damage. Falstad is excellent. I wonder if we may see Hinterland's Blast here. It was buffed with a cooldown reduction for each hero you hit with it. And Ring of Frost and Mosh Pit really set that up very well. So it'll be interesting to see if maybe Cole Slot opts to try for that Hinterland's Blast. Gust, though, is just so good. It's really hard to pass up the control and both defensive and offensive utility that uh, Gust provides. Jaina, of course, a nice burst healer, good zoning, good slows, and she pairs uh, particularly well with ETC because he can really set up all of her damage. House of Chez now has to round out their comp. I would imagine we'll see their primary tank, so maybe a Johanna or a Muradin. 
Corvarian. That's really good single target lockdown. They don't have too much in the way of follow up. So I'm really curious to see what they go with for this fifth selection. When I say follow up, they don't have a lot of chain CC. So Zul, so they're going triple melee on House of Chez. Zul is good on shrines. He can double soak two lanes. Zul's main strength, of course, is how quickly he clears lanes and that he can bounce back and forth between two lanes and get a double soak. So many teams will employ a strategy of uh, sending four to the first shrine and stalling and stalling and stalling as long as possible while Zul double soaks the other lane to get a nice XP advantage early in the game. Now last pick here for Cole Slot. You have to wonder if they're going to go double support or triple ranged, or they will pick up a second frontliner to pair up with ETC. I would really like to see a second frontliner, otherwise ETC is going to have to deal with Artanis and Varian and Zul all by himself. Although with Bone Prism and the lockdown from Varian, uh, you might see a support with Cleanse. So a couple different options, and they go with the Murky. I mentioned that. He is really annoying. He is very good right now. I really like the changes that they did to him. Um, so we will see. A very happy we got to see a murky game. Uh, first game out of the gates. Chat room, let me know how my volume is. Uh, I don't want to be blowing in the mic, certainly, so let me know if I sound better now. And here we go for our first game of the evening. Division 3 House of Chez versus Cole Slot. Both these teams looking to get their first win of Season 4, and one of them will certainly come away with that win today. I mentioned House of Chez has been around Chair League since Season 1. Coleslot, however, this is their first season as a team in Chair League, so still uh, maybe finding their footing a little bit. But breaking out the murky, my team busted out the murky. He did really well in our game, even though we did lose. Uh, it wasn't, certainly wasn't the murky pick that lost us that game. The blue team for House of Chez. We have Flash on Zul, Chez Mix on Artanis, Piche on Vala, Karabu on Brightwing, and No Dice on Variant. And the red team, the, are, the red team, Cole Slot. We have Chaos Risen on Jaina, Apex Red Five, on four, Falstad, Erd on two, ETC, one. the Bad Fish on Ariel, and Karstark Car on Murky. So both teams rushing to the mid lane for the early game skirmish, with the exception of Murky, who is going to be in the top lane. And it looks like Cole Slot is perfectly content to break off into their lane assignments already. Murky is in the top lane. He has placed his head. And there is the swap. Ario caught too far forward. ETC tries to save her, but to no avail. Both Brightwing and Vala do take good damage, but Ario will be first blood of the game. Nice swap uh, by... Chesmix on Artanis, and now he will come to the bottom. Flash setting up for the flank on the Falstad. The swap is missed, and nice barrel roll out of trouble by Apex Red. And now this game is really underway. We do see the two lane rotation here that I was talking about on Zul. He's capable of rotating between these two lanes and putting a lot of pressure on the map and also split pushing. Once again, the bad fish on Ariel is caught in a swap. She is trying to get away. A nice blizzard by Jaina to try to zone. The bad guys away and the bad fish barely escapes 169 hit points, but she is able to get herself out of trouble. It looks like in this top lane, Murky has chosen to go the fake egg, egg hunt at level one. And uh, no dice will definitely have a hard time up here laning against Murky. One of Varian's weaknesses is that pre-10 he has a hard time and Murky has excellent wave clear. So Murky will certainly uh, win this lane. Varian has his work cut out for him. So decision time for House of Chez. With a Zul in the mix, will they opt to let him soak two lanes, or will they actually send him up to the shrine? Nice power slide onto no dice, and Varian will fall. A good pick by ETC, and that puts Cole Slot 
uh, in the advantage right here. Falstaff still in the mid lane. So both teams have four heroes representing themselves in the top. And let's see where Zul is going to go. And he is out of here. So Zul will go rotate between the mid lane and the bottom lane. Try to get as much experience as possible. Brightwing is still in the bottom. False that away, so it looks like House of Ches is conceding almost this first tribute. Now Zul is returning to the top, so it looks like Zul is actually gonna. Okay, now he will participate. The swap on the Mercy, that of course is not who you want to do with that swap. DCC is hit in the Bone Prison, but once again, a real nice Boning Blizzard by Jaina. Help ETC get out of trouble there. Murky will fall, but that's what Murky is supposed to do, so certainly no problems there. Polspot is regrouping to try to get back into the grind. There are currently only nine Skeletal Guardians away. Flash very low to the damage from Jaina. DTC is uh, locked in and able to power slide away to safely. Many heroes on both sides low. They're kind of pulling each other out, dancing around the boxing ring, but no haymakers landed by either team. And Whole slot looks like they will be content to try to poke out the last six Shrine Guardians they need. Once again, they wait for Murky to spawn, and now they are invading one more time. They only need six. Jaina is very far forward, but ETC has a nice power side and shield, but now she has Arcanus on her. Murky falls once again, but they do get Zul for the trouble. This time, Chesnix is forced to use the swap defensively to get himself out of trouble, and Cole Slot secures the first Punisher. Yes, Lord Boo, it is best of one, and yes, it is Division 3. All of my games tonight, we have four of them, will be a one-game set, so everyone goes in here and has to show everything they have in the first game. Frozen Punisher baited over the wall properly by House of Chez, and it will be burned down in quick order, full slot securing the top wall. Murky is battling duel on the bottom, just missed the swap on Aria one more time, and now it looks like Cole Slot, due to their <clears throat> securing of this first Punisher of the game, has about a half a level lead in the early going here. However, looking at the map, House of Chez is in lanes, um, certainly more only Murky currently soaking for Cole Slot. So if they don't rectify that soon, they're going to uh, lose that level lead. Falstad does return to lane. Murky still putting pressure uh, on the bottom. Since we have a little well in the action, let's see what builds our heroes are going here. Uh, Backlash on Zul. Uh, and the Jailers with extra Skeletal Warriors. And so it looks like uh, Zul is going with the Skeletal build. Varian, um, I assume, will be going Taunt. That tends to be what people are doing nowadays. Vala, kind of a traditional Vala build. Um, nothing out of the ordinary here. Brightwing... Uh, I assume is going to be going the Big Tuna Kahuna build um, with the Living the Dream quest. Sorry, I missed that. Aria was picked. I assume it was in the top lane right here. Your game audio is too loud. Thank you, Anson, for letting me know. We can turn that down here just a little bit. Perfect. So kind of the lull between the objectives here. Murky is putting a lot of pressure on the bottom lane with the Mercs, forcing a three-man appearance from House of Chez to clear up this bottom lane. Cole Slot will be first to the objective. ETC and Jaina are here early. Looks like Murky is slowing down the rotation in the bottom lane. Three members of Cole Slot here only Falstad and Brightwing, I'm sorry, Falstad and Murky not here yet. They've gotten the early, early lead. Murky has taken down, but I think he's just buying time, preventing uh, other members of House of Chez from rotating. But once again, Ariel is caught, and a nice swap from Chesmit. And Cole Slot is going to have to withdraw here for the time being. Uh, or they're not. They're going to take this 5 on 4. Very dangerous, very risky. Murky out in front, soaking a lot of damage. Just missed the swap onto Jaina. She was able to juke out of the way. Both teams now getting very close to level 10. They will probably get it at very close to the same time. The current Skeletal Mage count, 24 to 23. So almost dead even. But Ariel has spawned now. 
and she is making her way down here. This is going to come down to which team gets 10s first and uses it, and another excellent swap by Chesmix. There goes Jaina. Both teams have reached 10. Skeletal Mages go out. ATC on his way out. Murky is killed, but once again, no big deal because it's Murky. Cole Slot, however, will withdraw. The Punisher has been secured by House of Chez, and this will give us a This will give us a uh, chance to go over the heroics. We have Blink Heal from Brightwing, Reign of Vengeance from Bala, Taunt from Varian, Skeletal Mages as we saw from Zul, and Purifier Beam from Artanis. On the side of Cole Slot, nice gust there by Falstad to barely save Jaina. On the side of Full slot we have ETC with stage dive. Falstad with Mighty Gust, Jaina with Ring of Frost. Murky chose to go March of the Murlax and Ariel, of course, on the Crystal Aegis. I did chain move the uh, overlay there. I did I forgot to switch it, guys. Sorry about that, but it should be in the right place now. So once again, we go into this lull period between the shrines. Cole Slot sending four members to secure their hard camp while Murky is tending to the bottom lane one more time. The, uh, Murky will almost certainly be caught here, and if his bubble is on cooldown, which it's not, he does get away safely. House of Chez, though, is securing the bottom hard camp. And an aggressive invasion here from Cole Slot with Murky keeping vision on most of the members of House of Chez. They felt confident enough to come in here and take their Merc Camp. So two Merc Camps pushing in the top lane for Cole Slot, while one pushes in the bottom lane for House of Chez. House of Chez responds, though, once they see that their Mercs have been taken, they know they can safely invade bottom. But this will work out much better for Cole Slot, though, with the Shrine appearing in the bottom, those mercs are going to do a ton of work in the top, but a really nice initiation by House of Chez. Ariel caught out one more time, Bone Prism, and she is taken out. So they are going to have to wait for Ariel before they can come challenge this. I imagine they will rotate down to take care of that mid lane push. Zul does go to the top lane. He will take care of the mercs that are pushing there. And he will probably be joining right about the time that Ariel spawns. And shows up as well. This is a one game set. An aggressive fly from Falstad and Gust. However, not much happening there. There's the Ring of Frost catches four members. There's the March of the Murlocs. There's the stage dive. Excellent execution by Cole Slot. Falstad does fall due to his aggressive positioning. However, the team fight most certainly in favor of Cole Slot. And they are pro probably going to secure this Punisher. They're working hard, however, before they lost that team fight, House of Chez was able to get 30 of them. So I don't think they will be able to have time to wrap up the last 10. No, most certainly not. 32 now for Cole Slot. And it will be a Mortar Punisher by the looks of it, pushing in the bottom lane. Good shot calling here by House of Chez. Getting Zul to put some pressure in the top lane that forces Falstad to respond. So they will have a little duel here in the top. In the meantime, this Mortar Punisher is at the bottom gate jumps over right onto Varian, and they proceed to burn it down very quickly. However, the bottom wall has already fallen with Murky, Jaina, Ariel, and ETC putting a lot of pressure. Nice power slide into a Crystal Aegis, using it as AoE damage. Varian and Artanis very low. Another big ring of frost lands on two members. The stage dive for the flank on the backside. Ariel does go down, though, with the tank stage diving to the back line. Ariel fell 
and this team fight is one for one. Now Falstad has joined from the top lane, Varian falling, Vala and Artanis in full retreat, a nice gust by Falstad, however, Artanis' shields will keep him up and he's able to turn it, taking out both Murky and Falstad and walking away with about 400 hit points. That was a very back and forth team fight, it ended up about even. With that Punisher though, Coleslot was able to secure the bottom four. Meanwhile, Flash in the top lane was trying to get some counter pressure here on the top fort. However, Falstad stayed around long enough to where they were able to defend. And structurally, a little bit of an advantage for Coleslot. But otherwise, this is a pretty even game. Levels very close to even. Uh, kills 10 to 7, so very close as well. And a one fort structural lead for Coleslot. So still certainly anybody's game. Coal slot will move to secure their punishers. However, Chez Mix is in the bush and he misses the swap on Jaina. Was very close. Now ETC may be a little out of position, but he does use the face melt to get himself out of trouble. Once again, Falstad flying to the bottom. This time not aggressively. He's just going to defend the bottom fort down here. Flew into a very safe position. Those mercs that were secured by Coleslot were already cleaned up by House of Chez. And there's a swap onto Falstad. The Bone Prison follow-up will root him. He tries to gust himself out of trouble. The Polymorph, 24 hit points. Very close. He does fall, though. That was a, a heroic burn there for Falstad. Caught out of position. Chez Mix has been really on point with his swaps and uh, secured a number of kills. His teammate has been spot on with the follow-up. Both teams now rotating to top. I will say Coleslot though has been much, much faster to the Punishers than House of Chez, and they're usually getting a little bit of a lead. They know they have to go rotate out to clear these mercs, otherwise they have pressure on the keep. So that allows Coleslot to buy a little time for Falstad to return. And with his flight, Falstad is going to be up uh, very shortly after House of Chez Reese is here, so this will be close to a 5-on-5. Five five. Falstad now coming in, but an aggressive spot for a fly. He notices it, barrel rolls very quickly, and now once again, both teams dancing around looking for that engagement. Full slot is already at 35 skeletal mages, though. It will be very tough. Now 37. There's the offensive gust right into his team, and another big ring of frost. Once again, though, Falstad goes down with the aggressive positioning. Murky goes down. Jaina goes down as well. So the counter initiation completely, completely obliterates Cole Slot and heartbreaking at 39 skeletal mages. They fall as a team. Murky is the only hope. He's hoping one of these Murlocs, March of the Murlocs, can they get one skeletal mage? One skeletal mage for the March of the Murlocs. I don't think they will. Murky is going to continue to try to suicide in here and get one. You can see Karstruck doing everything he can to do it. Chesmix on the swap, just trying to keep that pesky Murky away. They are able to do it. What a heartbreaker for Coleslot at 39 Skeletal Mages. They lost a big, big team fight. This top fort is already gone, and now they will be marching onto the keep walls. That is a big time turning point in this game and an excellent counter engage from House of Chez. Murky really did do all that he could to try to secure the last um, skeletal guardian on the shrine. But great, great zoning from Artanis and his teammates to keep him away. That one swap in particular was nicely done. Defensive gust once again from Falstad. They are doing a nice job of pulling the Punisher back to where they can attack it safely. Purifier Beam is zoning ETC away. Murky resumes the tank roll that ETC had to vacate temporarily. And there goes the top keep. House of Chez looks like they will be content to take their win, take their keep. Ooh, sorry, mouse up there. And retreat. They now have level 20, a 3 level advantage, a tier advantage, a keep advantage, and now they are looking to paint the map blue and really put the stranglehold here on Coleslot. They capture 
what is, I'm sure, the first of many hard caps, uh, hard camps, that they are going to secure during the downtime here. Full slot, of course, now has to do with catapult spawning in the top lane for the rest of this game. It'll be interesting to see how it goes. They really need a team fight win at this point. Uh, Cole Slot should be focusing on securing that level 20 so they don't have to fo uh, fight down a talent tier when the next team fight happens. So that's what they want. They really want to focus on soaking, getting level 20, and staying out of trouble uh, until they can secure that objective. However, all of the Merc camps on the map will be going to House of Chez with the possible exception of the one in the top right. Uh, are they going to invade? They have to figure that Cole Slot is up there. They are invading, but they showed in the middle lane, so this should not be any surprise to Cole Slot. They very quickly get out of there. They, they do secure the camp, but they get out quickly. And they went right by Murky's Egg, although with that talent Egg Hunt, they don't know which one is which. And uh, I wonder if they just didn't see it, or they decided it wasn't worth the trouble. Either way... Cole Slot now in the mid and bottom lanes, clearing out Merc camps. And now the mid lane will be the next site of the altars. And 20 has not been secured for Cole Slot. House of Chez getting very aggressive right now in their posturing. I wonder if they're trying to pick a fight with their level 20 advantage. They have not gone to the shrine yet. They are staying as five, and they are aggressively positioning themselves on Cole Slot's side of the map. I think we're going to have uh, this game decided here very, very soon. Now they have decided to go ahead and secure the objective, or are they just posturing? Oh, there, now he found the murky egg, but he thought it might be a fake, and he stepped away and used the cube just to be sure. Cole Slot very hesitant to come in here. They're doing everything they can to secure level 20 and they will have it momentarily let's see what they do so they have secured their 20s and 30 skeletal mages 35 it's probably going to be too late for coal slot 36 they are posturing moving into position to invade there goes the swap it just misses jana they're at 38 39 the initiation onto Artanis. There's the fly from Falstad. Once again, another big, big ring. Many people caught in it, but the Punisher is here. March of the Murlocs is out. ETC is down. Ariel is down. Falstad in trouble. Jaina in trouble. And the only man alive to tell the tale is Falstad. This could be game if House of Chess decides to go end top lane. And they are deciding they are a little low in the hit point department but the katas are already here so they will have the winions um, and it's almost a great swap by chesmix falstad doing everything he can to buy time but he is charged taunted and down he goes murky is the sole defender of the core here five men from house of chez attacking onto core the shields are down the core is rapidly depleting and there is game. House of Chez is able to secure the win. Their first win of season four. Congratulations to them. A very entertaining game. Was pretty close throughout, but really toward the, uh, toward the late game there, House of Chez took control and uh, won the last few team fights and really never let go of it. Uh, Anson asked for the uh, Storm Talents, Force of Will by Artanis, Bone Spear from Zul, Glory to the Alliance for Varian, Far Flight Quiver for Vala, Storm Shield for Brightwing, Crowd Pleaser on ETC, Epic Mount on Falstad, Improve Ice Block on Jaina, Big Tuna Kahuna as I anticipated on Murky, and Shield of Hope was on Ariel. So GG's to both teams, House of Chez picking up the W. And now our second game will be Fogit About It versus Board 8. Uh, so I've got to go in that lobby and round up 
uh, those teams. We should be going here very shortly. The game is scheduled to start here in about five minutes. And let's see who we have here. Okay, looks like both teams should be ready to go. All right, well, we're running right on schedule. Uh, ever since Jova switched to the 20 minute team blocks instead of 30, that really helped uh, Caster schedule these back to back games like this without running late. Because 40 minutes between games is perfect because that game ended with four minutes to spare, which is spectacular. So we have another Division III um, best of one game. Looks like we will be going back to Infernal Shrines. So back-to-back -back Division Three Infernal Shrines game. That's fine with me. I really enjoy uh, Infernal Shrines as one of my favorite maps. One of the reasons I like it is the design of the map really allows you to uh, try different strategies on it, split pushing, and it's it's big without being too big like I think Warhead Junction is. And for that reason is why I like it, that you can try so many different strategies and uh, team comps that can be successful. There's not really any one dominant um, thing you can do on that map. And it's just fun. And uh, also the carpet animation of John Sp Cena is spectacular. All right, so uh, bear with me while I get some administrative tasks going here. All right, so we have the lobby created. We are waiting for Forget About It to come on down. Uh, both of these teams are new to Chair League in Season 4. Both teams currently at one win and one loss. So one of these teams will get to go above the 500 mark and the other will fall slightly below. Of course, all teams trying to qualify for their respective divisions playoffs. Looks like one of our teams is having some uh, technical difficulties, so they should be around momentarily. One of the things I'm surprised that last game we didn't see is there was no Kerrigan. No Kerrigan ban. Uh, Infernal Shrines is probably her best battleground. There was no Kerrigan ban. There was no Kerrigan uh, selection. Also, Sonya was MIA. So. Uh, curious uh, if we'll see a similar draft or something completely different. All right, let's see if we can get our second team in here in the meantime. All right, so uh, populating the lobby now. And it looks like uh, board eight is coming in here right now. And as soon as they fill out, we will get forget about it in here as well.
All right. One team down, one team to go. And then we will be on our way to our second game of a four-game Division Three set. Some other changes made early in the patch this week. We did see Varian last game. I really liked the change they did with him. They swapped his level 16 and level 13 talents. So one of the reasons I like to select Varian was as a counter to all the shields that are out there, the Zarya's and the Tassadars and the Artanises. But that shield breaker talent, Shattering Throw, came so late at 16. Uh, and the developers recognized that too. And that's why they said they bumped him up so that way you could um, get his talents that counter that, like uh, his one that lowers the healing. I forget what it is, but uh, there's a couple different good ones that you can select now at 13, and then the banners were moved to 16. <clears throat> and then we uh, did have, of course, false dad, but he went Gust instead of Hinterlands. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to mess around with Hinterlands. And uh, see if it's something that's worth taking. I think with the cooldown reduction, if you had the right setup for it, um, it could be uh, viable in the right situation. I th still think you're going to see Mighty Gust certainly more. Uh, you're certainly going to still see Mighty Gust more than Hinterlands, but hopefully it gets them a little bit closer, uh, makes Hinterlands Blast a little bit more viable. And here we go for game two. Fogita bought it, the blue team, first pick, first ban. Last game we had a Malfurion first ban. Uh, would not be surprising to see that again. Other possible first bans on Infernal Shrine, maybe a Rag or an Artanis. Uh, you could also see Kerrigan as sometimes first ban. And they're going to opt for the Ragnaros uh, ban. We didn't see Lucio last game. I would be surprised uh, if we didn't see him at least once today. Uh, generally, from what I've heard, you know, Dreadnought was tweeting that he thinks Lucio is now the second best healer in the game behind Malfurion. The team speed that he gives is really useful if you can coordinate it. You know, and that, that speed boost that he gives, a little less useful in uh, Hero League where you're kind of playing with people you don't know, but in an organized environment, even casually like Chair League where you're on comms with your other games, that speed boost can do some pretty neat things. So... I'm very interested to see what these coordinated teams are going to do with Lucio. He has some um, has some really interesting talents that I'm anxious to see uh, used, especially in like a five-man coordinated setting. Board eight bans Diablo. That's a little bit unusual as a first ban. However, Diablo is very tanky and a really solid hero all around. So that's not certainly not a terrible ban by any stretch of the imagination. You know, one of the interesting things about Chair League, you, if you watch the pro games, you see the teams know each other so well and they've scouted each other so well. Uh, they'll have targeted bans for, for specific players. But in a casual setting like this, in Chair League, you know, the scouting tools are very limited. You can look players up on hot slogs, of course, or maybe watch their past Chair League matches that they were casted. But these teams really don't know each other very well. So you don't really have targeted bans. But you might have a comfort ban. Maybe Board 8 just doesn't like playing against Diablo, hence the ban. I know I've had a couple teams that I've played on where we just had certain heroes, like right now, Artanis is one of them, that we just don't like playing against. And sometimes those bans almost become like comfort bans for the teams. We're just more comfortable when we're not playing against that hero. So Fogita about it. First pick's Artanis. And board eight responds with a Malfurion and an ETC. Both of those heroes uh, offer a ton of value with CC. They set each other up very well. Uh, Mosh Pit and a Twilight Dream, or even just a Power Slide Face Melt into the uh, lawn that Malfurion puts out there is really solid for isolating out an op opposing hero. 
early game, you can certainly get picks with that. <clears throat> so something for Fogita about it to be careful of. They're now on the clock for picks number two and three before we go to the second ban phase. Anytime you have Artanish, of course you're looking for that big time swap. So I would expect to see some kind of follow-up crowd control for when he lands that big swap. Instead, they opt for Rhaegar and Varian. So there, Varian is the follow-up support uh, that I was talking about. The stun and the taunt, that's the lockdown that you need after that Artanis, that big, big Artanis swap. Rhaegar, of course, is always solid. Hey, both of his ultimates are very viable right now. Uh, Bloodlust is great with Artanis, so if they secure another auto attacker, you could really get some good mileage out of Bloodlust on Rhaegar. Also, if you go uh, double uh, lightning, sh lightning Shield, Lightning Bond at level 1, it really helps on the Shrine Guardians. So a uh, nice solid support in Rhaegar for Fogit about it. Fort 8. Now making their second ban. Really talking it over in chat, I'm sure. And they opt to ban the Gul'dan. That's a really good ban. Gul'dan has a ton of damage and a ton of clear. He can really be a pain in the butt. And it looks like Fogitabatit will respond with a Jaina ban, or at least they're thinking about it. And that Jaina ban would make a lot of sense. ETC Jaina and mouth together kind of really synergize really well. ETC and mouth can set up Jaina for all of her AoE damage that she does. They can set her up for the Ring of Frost. It's really a lot of lockdown, and all of those talents harmonize really well together. So they're really thinking about that Jaina, and I would not be surprised if that's the decision that they went. About 15 seconds on the clock, so we're going to see this decision made here pretty soon. With their uh, healer and their tank already off the board, there's really no other roles that forget about it can strangle it out. So they do opt to go with the Jaina ban to keep that harmony away from ETC and Malfurion. Two choices now for board eight. I would expect we're going to see at least one ranged damage dealer here, uh, possibly two. Could also see a second off tank or a, or a second support. I mean, with, with their first two choices being Malph and ETC, really almost anything could pop up here. That is certainly the advantage to taking your tank and healer early in the draft is you're not roped into selecting those heroes later in the draft so you can uh, kind of pick what you need based on what the other team is selecting and when you pick etc mouth early it certainly doesn't tip your hand to the other team because uh, really you can put almost anything around that they opt to go with a vala and a zool i did go over zool last game he can double rotate lanes in this uh, house of Chez didn't really stick to that strategy uh, as much as some teams do last game. They kind of moved him around a little bit, and he went to the Shrines and back out again. But I've seen some teams really keep Zul double soaking for a significant portion of the early game to try to get themselves that XP lead. Of course, Vala just uh, heaps and heaps of damage, excellent mobility. She is squishy, so she's not one of those heroes that you can be poor with your positioning with and uh, expect to make it out alive. Last two picks for Fogita about it. Uh, we're going to see at least one, I would guess, two damage dealers here. There's Falstad for the Global and Kael'thas. So Kael'thas, this is certainly one of his better battlegrounds with uh, so many places to spread the Living Bomb and nice corridors. Uh, that are certainly about the size of his Q talent. And Falstad uh, can sort of respond to Zul with the global a little bit. And of course, Gust. Uh, I, I would expect we will see Gust out of Falstad here. The, they don't have quite as much setup for Hinterlands here, but you never know. Uh, you never know. 
last pick on the side of board eight, I would expect a range DPS of some sort. Uh, Sonya is also good on this map if they opt to go triple uh, front line, as is Kerrigan I mentioned earlier. Six seconds left, we will know very shortly. And they opt to go Anubarak. Interesting. I, I am a little concerned about board eight's damage. They really are heaping a lot of the pressure on Vala to do damage to the other team. However, they have a lot, and I mean a lot of CC. ETC, Zul, Anubarak, Mouth, even Vala if she goes the Reign of Vengeance. Uh, the other consideration, though, Board 8, they just took triple melee into Kal uh, Kalthos' Living Bomb, so they really, really need to be aware of their positioning and not to spread Living Bomb amongst the team. That is uh, not something that you want to do um, if you want to come away from this game successful. Uh, generally, taking triple melee into Kalthos is unadvised. However, Anubaract is particularly good at stunting the opposition team's ability damage, uh, which is most of where Fogit about its damage is going to come from. Kael'thas is basically exclusively uh, ability damage. Falstad can go either way, but even if he takes an auto attack build, he still does get a nice chunk of his damage from his abilities. Um, Artanis, most of his damage is from auto attacks. So very curious to see how this game goes. Um, I think I like Fogita about its draft just a little bit more. The triple triple melee into that Kael'thas is concerning for me. And uh, the swap into a Varian Kael'thas stun uh, can turn a 5-on-5 five five into a 5-on-4 very, very quickly. So for the red team, board 8, we have Shad Shadun on, I believe that's Zul. Bart's on Anubarak. Jeffrey's on Malfurion. Terrace the Dawn on ETC, and Katarn on Vala. The blue team, Fogit about it, we have Tofts on Rhaegar, Jstad on Falstad, Mr. Potatoes on Artanis, MJ Doom on Varian, and Unadverted, Unaverted on Kael'thas. So both teams look like they will take their place in the mid lane for the customary 5-on-5 five five skirmish. And Artanis is trying to posture. You can see he wants to get the long-range swap and get the early pick in flanking position here. We'll see if he is able to land that big swap. However, he decides it's not worth his trouble. He rotates, and Fugit about it is already in lane. False at top, Artanis bottom, and three members here to take mid. Looks like Artanis will take the solo lane while board eight goes into a four-man rotation. Artanis is caught out, power slide, Bone Prison, and a lot of damage. Artanis gets the heal from Rhaegar, but goes down anyway. First Blood goes to board eight, picking out a slightly overextended Artanis now. And now I imagine they will return to their four-man rotation. Fogit about it doesn't seem to want to do the rotation. They want to seem to leave one man in lane. So Varian needs to be careful. He is going to be caught out here if he doesn't realize they're rotating. He is a little late. There's the Root, Bone Prism, Power Slide, and there goes Varian. Very close, but there's the Living Bomb that I was talking about. Kael'thas is already doing a ton of damage. However, both Artanis and Varian have been caught out with this four-man rotation, and you really have to be aware of that. With ETC and Malfurion, and Zul, that's a lot of lockdown. If you get caught out, you're probably going to die. Vala is there for the damage. So it looks like in this top lane, Anubarak is bullying Jstad on Falstad a little bit. Board 8 already here. They have started the shrines. It will be a Mortar Guardian. ETC zoning out Kael'thas and slight early Shrine Guardian lead going to Board 8. It looks like the beat about it is very patient. They are biding their time. They do have a slight level lead here, 4 to 3, in that 4-man rotation. It looks like Board 8 lost a little bit too much soak through those early kills. However, Fogita about is very late to challenge this 
Shrine Guardian. Mr. Potatoes on Arcana pop out again. He will go down, but ETC and Anubarak both so low. They do are able to get away. ETC is taking the Living Bomb to his team. He had to back out, otherwise he would have transferred that Living Bomb to his teammate. And once he backed up, he went right into Varian range. They were able to lock him down and kill him. So he's about it now on the Shrine. Vala very low. The Living Bomb will it get her, and it does not, but it's very close. Only eight more Skeletal Mages needed for board eight. And they are now reinvading. It is currently a four on three in favor of Fogita about it. They only need two more, does board eight. However, they are once again having to retreat, taking a lot of damage. That living bomb is still being spread amongst everybody. Board eight able to secure it after a very back and forth team fighting there. Falstad goes in the top lane to split soak. Fogita about it in position to and it jumps onto Kael'thas. That's not what you want. You want it to jump onto Varian or Arcanus, but they do manage to bait it back nicely. It is going down very quickly. Board 8 will secure the front wall and get some damage on the fort. And now they will be content with their gains to back up. However, you look at the levels, the levels are dead even despite three kills to one in favor of board eight and that's because Fogit about it has been much more diligent about lane soaking the uh, rotation hasn't been quite as fast as you would like it for board eight and they've missed some soak as a result and that's why despite the front wall and despite the kill advantage that board eight is a little bit um that they're not ahead in xp that they're about even they're actually a little behind by about a quarter level that's not a lot when you look at the map right now and this is an excellent example Fogita about it has all lanes covered no soak is being missed while board eight only has a new Barak in lane so they really want to try to make this rotation a little bit faster is what they want because that's where they're missing the soak is in this four man rotation Kael'thas did go Convection at 1, and he is almost done with his stacks. So that's good news for Fogita about it. Once he finishes his Convection stacks, not only does he do more damage, but he can be a little bit less conservative with his positioning because he doesn't need to worry about losing them. See, this has been a long time in the bottom lane without anybody to soak by board 8. Finally, Rule does come down here. They're uh, about, I would say, 30 to 40 percent of the level. Uh, behind an XP right now. Both tanks for Fogit about it are in position in the fog of war there, hiding in the vents. And the next Guardian will spawn in the bottom lane. And we don't know which variety it will be. Azul walking into a trap. There's the stun, but the roots come out for appeal. The damage dealers weren't with the tanks there, so Azul really wasn't in any big time trouble without Kael'thas or false had to follow up on that and it will be an arcane punisher largely regarded as the strongest one etc and very far ahead and here comes a new Barak. etc is swapped away both arcanist and et very low in life both able to walk away slowly and go back to their healers to freshen up living bomb on duel he does get away from his team to not spread it and he has to do it again that living bomb is really forcing these guys to go out of position and slowly board eight is being forced back here there's the stun on duel he does explode counter engage from etc onto varian they do a lot of damage not able to finish him off etc down to 84 hit points before his healer gets to him and he is able to get away board eight is forced back one more time this second uh, Guardian will almost certainly go to Fogit about it. Now at 36, 37. Trying Guardian, Ford 8 giving it one more try. However, there is the Shrine Guardian secured. Ford 8 on retreat one more time. Artanish dash, Living Bomb. Falstad did have to fly the top lane though to take care of the mercenaries that were up there. Board 8 is unable to bait the Punisher over the wall uh, because they were in retreat and it jumped onto ETC. So level 10s are taken by Fogit about it. 
Artanis taken in the swap, and he does is able to burrow away safely. Board 8 really needs to retreat. You can't fight 10 into no 10. Ultimate score, forget about it. We have Taunt on Varian, Purifier Beam on Artanis. Bloodlust on Rhaegar, Phoenix on Kael'thas, and Falstad is very coyly holding his heroics. Will it be Hinterland's Blast? Will it be Mighty Gust? I imagine it will be Mighty Gust, but Jstad is opting to hold his selection until he absolutely needs to make it. Bottom Fort was destroyed for uh, board eight, and Fogita about it able to secure their enemies hard camp as well. So level 10 for board 8. We have Locust Swarm on Anubarak, Twilight Dream on Malfurion, Skeletal Mages on Zul, Mosh Pit on ETC, and Reign of Vengeance on Vala. Mosh Pit, of course, one of the most decisive heroics in the game. Can absolutely change a team fight and a game. Really the only uh, interrupt they have for it is Falstad went Mighty Gust. So that's their answer to Mosh Pit. Maybe Jstad was holding his ultimate to see what uh, each of the took. So they have the Kael'thas Thun. Uh, they could also swap if they needed to. Um, or of course Gust. Gust is the answer to Mosh. Fall, or, uh, Rhaegar was picked off in the bottom lane here. And now board 8 getting aggressive. They do have the 5 on 4 advantage. ETC and Anubrak opting not to move in. They do back up. I, I kind of thought they would be aggressive there, but maybe seeing the level 13 to level 11 advantage in favor of Fogit about it. So board 8 added this advantage here for sure. They are two levels down. They're, it's one. They're going to pick up 12 right now. So one and a half levels down. But more importantly, a talent tier down. However, Falstad did sense the gank coming and got out of dodge very quickly. Good map press um, awareness by Jstab. Board 8 is starting the shrines. However, they need to be very careful. This is a very aggressive decision. Swap initiation. There's a three-man mush, but mosh, but the immediate gust by Jstab. And there goes Anubarak. There goes ETC. And board eight has to really be in full retreat. All of their living members are too low to continue fighting this. Mr. Potatoes just misses the swap on Zul. Two members down for board eight. None for Fogit about it. It was a nice three-man mosh. However, Jstad was Johnny on the spot. He was ready to go with his gust and really didn't allow that mosh pit to develop. This frozen punisher most definitely going to go to Fogit about it. And board eight looks like they will be assuming defensive positions after securing this top hard camp. So there is no wall in the mid lane to bait it over. No defenders here on the side of board 8, so you wonder, are they conceding this, or are they just a little late? Anubrak does get the one that gets jumped on, that's about what you want, and now they have it behind the fort. So while Fogit about it burns down that mid fort, board 8 is trying to burn down John Cena. He's not even at half health yet, so there's once again the body slam onto Anubarak. ETC is in the bottom lane, trying to soak the side lane, and you have a two-person swap. Vala goes down, as well as Malfurion. John Cena once again jumping on Anubarak. He really does not like Anubarak. Bogeet about it in full control of this game. And they have their eyes set on making sure the first keep of the game falls and it does not quite yet. Oh, there goes Anubarak. He tried to be aggressive in his defense, drive away Fogit about it, uh, but they turned it on him with the taunt and the lockdown, and down went Anubarak. Still refusing to give up this fort now that they are here in force, and low mana bars forces Fogit about it to retreat.
So with the three level advantage and the full talent tier advantage, the world is really bogeyed about its oyster. They're going to absolutely paint this map blue. Falstad will start the top mercs uh, in the hard camp. They have already secured Ford 8's hard camps. However, I mentioned they were low on mana, so everybody went to go ahead and hearth back, make sure they were topped off. In the meantime, Board 8 is busy clearing out mercs, doing the best they can to soak as much as they can. What uh, Board 8 really needs at this point is they really want a pick. And the way the comeback mechanics work in Heroes of the Storm, uh, kills are worth significantly more, uh, significantly more experience for Board 8. Uh, than they are for Heroes of Chez. So even if Board 8 can get into a team fight where they can just trade 3 for 3, that actually works in their favor. They will get more experience, and their death timers will in fact be shorter, allowing them to come up sooner. So even a team fight split uh, would do a little bit to get Board 8 back in this game, because right now they are certainly on the back foot with Fogit about it in full control. Fogit about it also has mercs pushing in mid and in top. They are in position on the shrine. Three levels up and a talent tier up. Board 8 feels like they have to contest it. This is going to be a very risky proposition with this kind of a level differential. However, here they are. And both teams kind of skirmishing. Falstad is kind of down here in a flank position. I think he's maybe waiting for the mosh pit. Good patience by Falstad. Not really there's the gust now that's the big counter to mosh pit however the gust into the taunt etc goes down very quickly malfurion is very low unable to do much Bala does put good damage on the kp however the swap takes Bala out of position the purifier beam will finish her off there's the stun by kalefoss onto a new barack and he does escape with very little hit points except for the living bomb is able to polish him off Mr. Potatoes isn't done yet. A swap on the pursuit. KT and Artanis are absolutely not willing to let him go. Living Bomb again on Zul. However, Mouth and Zul do make it out alive barely. And this uh, Punisher currently sitting at 33 Skeletal Guardians in favor of Bogeet about it. And this is a really good strategic decision by them to take out the bottom teeth walls. So when they do secure this Punisher, there will be no wall for it. board eight to ha bait it behind. There will be no set defense for them. It will just walk right into that cube. Uh, not only that, but that allowed Kalefoss to go all the way back and fill up on mana. So really, really smart decision making here by Phil Beat about it. Board eight in the meantime, trying to get some pressure somewhere on the map, does secure the hard camp. Jstat is in a little bit of a wonky position here, but does not get himself into a terrible spot. He wasn't caught up there, and I'm sure will fly down to join his team momentarily. So three level advantage. However, for the first time in a long time, Board 8 is on the same talent tier. And this is going to be their best chance for a team fight that they get catching uh, Fogit about it before 20. This bottom keep is certainly going to go down. Board 8 doing everything they can to burn down John Cena. So that way, when they do take a fight, it will simply be a five-on-five -five team fight without a Punisher jumping all over them. Bogeet about it, moving in towards four. Living Bomb and the Q on Kael'thas. He power slides into the core to save himself, but a Nubarak goes down. Zul goes down. Bloodlust, Gust, everything. Full offense for Bogeet about it. ETC stuns, taunted. A nice reign of vengeance from Vala, but not going to be enough. Rhaegar may fall but no and this is going to be game mr potatoes is running for his life and he does fall however with a core at 35 percent and four members still alive this game will go to fogeet about it since about halfway through they really really controlled this game they will improve their record to two and one board eight falling to one and two so we have wins for both of our Artanis teams so far this game, and in both of these first two games on Infernal Shrines, the uh, Artanis swaps have really been a huge factor in deciding uh, which way this game went. Both Artanis players 
uh, Mr. Potatoes in this game, and uh, I believe it was Chez in the first game who were hitting their swaps really consistently, and the team always there to follow up and get the kills. Um, you can see Falstad, his hero damage low, but 142,000 siege damage. He was really all over the map, split pushing, clearing mercs, making sure his team never had too much pressure to deal with. And with so much damage coming out of Kael'thas, 71,000 this game, he was almost 50,000 hero damage ahead of the second highest damage in the game. So with Unaverted on Kael'thas doing so much damage, that really um, allowed Falstad to fly all over there because they didn't need his damage as much. And especially when there's a level difference like that, uh, those spells hurt that much more. So congratulations to Fogit about it on their win today, increasing their record to 2-1 and one on Chair League uh, this season. And our next game will be Heroes of Overleague versus Pepperidge Farm Remembers. Once again, all Division Three team game, all Division Three games today, all best of three games, and we are on our third game of four, scheduled to start in a little less than ten minutes here. So we're going to go back in the lobby, make sure we have both teams ready to go. And let's see how we're looking. All right, looks like there's plenty of people here, so we uh, might be ready to go here. So we're really moving right along here. These games running right on schedule, keeping us uh, from running late or delaying anybody. Both games have so far have been pretty entertaining. Both kind of followed a little bit of the same path. The first one was a little bit closer, uh, but both teams, uh, House of Chez and Fogit about it, uh, took control of the game late and really never looked back. Uh, Fogit about it in particular really had a, a hard uh, forget about it had, had a big level lead late and uh, that's just so hard to engage into that much of a <laughs> into that much of a uh, level lead and uh, talent tier discrepancy. So we're, uh, <laughs> Jstat, I will actually, uh, next on the list is Valera. I need to pick up Valera and get her to level 5. So that will be some of where that 21,000 gold is going. Just waiting for the map choice here uh, for Pepperidge Farm Remembers. Of course, in Chair League, the away team gets to choose the map, and the home team gets first ban. Uh, both of these games, Artanis has gotten through the ban phase and has been first picked overall. And both times, Artanis's swaps were huge, absolutely huge, in deciding uh, who won the game. So far, first pick Artanis is uh, 2-0 in our Chair League games today. Oh, excuse me, I'm on the very tail end of a cold here, so almost, almost all the way better. So still waiting for <clears throat> Pepperidge Farm remembers to decide on their map choice. Uh, we do still have a few minutes, technically five minutes, before our 
uh, scheduled wait time. Um, but we can get it going, uh, at least the lobby in the meantime. So Braxis Holdout will be the map, changing it up a little bit, going from a larger three-lane map to a smaller two-lane map. I really like Braxis Holdout. It's a lot of fun, um, and it's definitely a little bit different uh, from Infernal Shrines because this is a battlefield where the, um, the objective really rewards heroes who can just anchor that satellite spot. You know, if you can hold that um, point down, uh, that's very valuable to your team. So Johanna, uh, Rexar, Artanis, uh, Chen, uh, all get a lot of value because they can just sit there and hold that point. They're very hard to displace from there. <clears throat> Wave clear also um, very important on Braxis holdout. Um, you never want to plan to lose. However, if you do lose the Zerg rush, you really need to be able to clear them out quickly. And AOE wave clear is the best way to do that. Um, and with that in mind, Kael'thas is excellent for that, as is Gul'dan. Jaina's also pretty good. Sylvanas is pretty good at doing that. Um, Tychus in his Odin form really burns through those things pretty quickly. Um, and the pros really prioritize uh, medic on this because of her global and the fact that she can put a beam on whoever and that person is just very difficult to get off the satellite uplink. You can basically have somebody hold that spot. So a lot of different choices uh, that you can do on Braxis. Um, I've also seen teams uh, run Hammer to great effect, uh, including my own team. Uh, this is a, an interesting map, too, in that even though it's one of the smaller maps, <coughs> globals are really important on here because they allow you to rotate between the two satellite uplinks quickly. And even though it's a small map, just the way that the terrain is set up, there's no... Um, There's no direct path from the two. There's no direct path from the two satellite uplinks. So you kind of have to go around. So even though the map is small, um, walking or uh, mounting and riding from the two points takes longer than you think it would uh, for that reason. Uh, still have not seen uh, Lucio today, which is a little surprising. Uh, we still have two games left, so could still see him. Uh, we did see one murky, though, uh, which was fun. Maybe we'll see a little more murky. He's uh, certainly viable right now. I think uh, I've, I've been playing him a little bit lately, and uh, he's really good. I think the best build for him is probably his slime build. Um, however, Big Tuna Kahuna is a lot of fun, and all of his talents have really fun names. So great job on Blizzard to uh, make those talents uh, such great names. So have about one minute before we're officially going live. Both teams almost in uh, lobby here. have blue team is heroes of overleague and of course the red team pepperidge farm remembers so just going to assign each team captains here for the draft and then we will get this show on the road game three of our four Division three of Palooza tonight. And game four uh, will be our 
la our last game, the next game, will be uh, both 2-0 and o teams. So trying to stay undefeated in Division Three will be our last two games. Um, for this game, both of these teams, like last game, are 1-1. One and one. Uh, Both of these teams also... <clears throat> I lied. Pepperidge Farm is new to Chair League. While uh, Heroes of Overleague, they did play... Uh, last season, they went 1-4 and four in Division 2, and uh, now they are here in Division 3. And off we go. Brexis holdout. All right, so we are officially underway in the draft Heroes of Overleague versus Pepperidge Farm Remembers. And there is the Artanis ban. He crushed it the first two games. So that's certainly not surprising. He's in a really good spot right now. And uh, if you can land those long-distance swaps, they're just so good, and it's such a powerful tool to uh, pick off an enemy teammate. You can do, or an enemy uh, hero, and you can do it from so many different angles. So Artanis will be the first ban for Heroes of Overleague. Pepperidge Farm Remembers is considering their first ban now. Um, Rag is excellent on Braxis Holdout. Uh, Molten Core is really good at defending the Zerg Waves. Uh, the Lava Wave, if you opt to do that instead of Sulfurous Smash, uh, helps defend as well. Instead, they ban Lucio. So... Although he was not involved in either of the first two games, he is involved in this one in the form of a first ban, Lucio. And Ragnaros, first pick, almost insta-locked for Heroes of Overleague. He's just really good. Uh, his ultimates are both excellent, and his trait, Molten Core, has a lot of utility. Pepperidge Farm responds with Malfurion and Gul'dan, the best healer in the game. Gul'dan does a ton of damage, and his wave clear is just off the charts for Braxis Holdout. This draft is really flying. Heroes of Overleague immediately respond with Johanna, who's probably the best wave clearing tank, with the possible exception of Dahaka, and Rhaegar, who is also an excellent support. Generally, you'll see on this map an organized play You'll see one solo laner in the top lane and then a four-man in the bottom. So <clears throat> Heroes of Overleague has their solo laner already. It would be Rag. That's something that we're going to keep an eye out for Pepperidge Farm Remembers. They uh, need to keep their keep in mind that they probably should be drafting a solo laner. Currently, though, discussing who their second ban will be with a tank and a healer already off the board. I imagine we're going to see some kind of ranged DPS ban here, somebody they don't want to see. Kael'thas would be a good one, um, as would Jaina. Six seconds left, and it's going to be Li Ming. Li Ming can certainly turn team fights with her resets. However, with so much going on on this on uh, Braxis Holdout and the wave clear being so necessary, um, I don't think this is one of her stronger maps. So a little surprised by the Li Ming ban. Heroes of Overleague now debating. I imagine we're going to see a tank ban from Heroes of Overleague as Pepperidge Farm Remembers has not selected their tank yet. Looks like it's going to be ETC. Stage Dive is excellent on Braxis Holdout. Mosh Pit is always good, but being able to add an extra global to your team's toolbox makes Stage Dive extra good on Braxis in particular. And... ETC will see a ban because of that. Two picks now for Pepperidge Farm Remembers. I imagine we'll see at least one tank here. Possibly two. Um, a lot of teams opt for double tank on Braxis Holdout. That way you can have a tank in each lane. Dahaka is still on the board. And he is really good on Braxis Holdout. He could take that solo lane. There's the Sylvanas I mentioned early. She is any map where she can push with some kind of objective really gives her trait a lot of value. However, um, if you, she doesn't have that trait to push with, 
it, it makes her trait significantly less valuable. So you really want to make sure that you win those Zerg waves and allow her to push with that Zerg wave to get maximum usage out of her out of her disabling arrows. There's the Dahaka pick I recommended. Good selection for Pepperidge Farmer members. He's great wave clear, good initiation, and of course his global. I would imagine um, we'll see a second tank for Pepperidge Farmer members on their last pick. Before that though, Heroes of Overly gets to round out their team for this game. I would not be surprised to see two range damage dealers here. They do already have Rag and Joe in the front line and their support. So maybe a Kael'thas, Vala is still on the board, Lunara is still out there. Uh, Raynor is always steady Eddie for good damage. Um, if they wanted to take another frontliner, Sonia is still out there. She's in a really good spot right now. Really taking their time on this one, debating their different options. About six seconds left, so there's Arthas. So triple frontline for heroes of Overly and Vala. So a lot of pressure on Vala to do a, to do the bulk of the damage work here. And Johanna and Arthas both tend to be a little bit uh, immobile. They're not particularly quick. So the one concern I have with Heroes of Overleague's um, draft here is they don't have a lot of tools to initiate um, a team fight. So I would be curious to see how they're going to run that. Pepperidge Farm remembers now has to pick their last member. I think it really has to be um, another frontliner. Uh, could be Muradin or um, you know Sonia, like I mentioned before. Diablo is still on the board, who's very good. And they opt to go with Zarya. So we have four melee and one ranged for Heroes of Overleague. And four ranged and one melee for Pepperidge Farm Remembers. So definitely a conflict in styles, a clash in styles here. Uh, we're going to see if Pepperidge Farm Remembers is able to kite the more immobile Heroes of Overleague. Or if Heroes of Overleague is just going to use their bulkier, more durable team to simply bully Pepperidge Farm Remembers off of the satellite uplinks. I could see it going both ways. <clears throat> uh, Ghoul Dan, though, is going to put a lot of poke damage onto that front line. It will be interesting to see how that front line holds up and how Rhaegar keeps up with uh, Ghoul Dan and uh, Zarya. Zarya is a hero who can really do a lot of damage, but that's on the player, in this case Afropuff, to manage your energy. If she can keep her energy up high, she does a, a lot of a lot of work, but you can't go into a team fight with low energy. You want to go into the fight already having your energy built up so you don't have to build it up during the course of the fight. And that's really one of the difference between a good Zarya player and maybe an average one. So here on the blue team, Heroes of Overleague, we have... Oh, he's really moving. I can't read it. Presty D on Arthas, Johanna on, I'm sorry, Ronov on Johanna, Murky Nathor on Ragnaros, Sendian on Rhaegar, and Bryloman on Vala. And on Pepperidge Farm Remembers, we have Afropuff on Zarya, Hardwood on Gul'dan, Nuka on Malfurion, Flava Flav on Sylvanas, and Doug Funny 13 on Dahaka. They're going to use Sylvanas to try to get a tower out of this. Only Ragnaros is here um, right now. So far, one tower. Now the rotation is coming from Heroes of Overleague. They are just arriving now. Maybe Pepperidge Farm remembers gets a second tower, but they are opting to retreat wisely. They do get one and a half towers and take the early advantage in the top lane. Neither team now has anybody in the bottom, but now Dahaka burrows down there, taking advantage of that global, while Rhaegar has to go down there. So I really like what Pepperidge Farm members did there. They forced um, Heroes of Overleague to take 
to, to redo their lane assignments how they wanted to. So now Rhaegar and the Haka are squaring off in the bottom lane, and that I think is going to be a matchup that favors the Haka. Um, you can see his wave clear is just better, and he has self-sustained. Meanwhile, in the top lane, Heroes of Overleaf getting absolutely bullied. Everybody is very low life. Dude, Dan is just doing a ton of poke damage along with Vala. Nice three-man root from Arthas, uh, but there's no follow-up there. Vala gets away with about 30 hit points, and now Molten Core is popped just to relieve the pressure. Push back to your Pepperidge Farmer members just a little bit. Give his team some breathing room. And uh, it will accomplish that, but Heroes of Overly, their, their life bars are very low, and they're not going to be able to contest this. They, they're going to need to go tap. An often overlooked aspect of Braxis Holdout is control of these globe generators. And right now, Pepperidge Farm remembers is absolutely controlling both globe generators, and gives your team so much more sustain uh, when you can control them. They will absolutely secure this top satellite uplink. Bottom is being secured by Dahaka, but almost all of Heroes of Overleague are rotating down. Doug Funny sniffed out something was going on, and he backed out safely. But that allows a four-man push with Sylvanas on the top fork. Heroes of Overleague not quite sure how to respond to this pressure now. And we're going to have the first port of the game fall at 2 minutes and 33 seconds. Excellent pressure by Preferred Farm remembers. They're not quite sure how to respond. They are going to try to sneak this, but with only Rhaegar and Vala here, now Ragnaros getting here a little late. Even still, this is a four on three, and certainly not a battle Heroes of Overleague wants to take. They need to have, they needed to send a second person down to bully the Haka off this. So with these teams as currently constructed, there is not a situation that Heroes of Overleague has found to allow them to not get bullied in one of the two lanes. And as a result, a full level lead for Pepperidge Farm remembers and currently in control of this map. Sylvanas already putting pressure on the top keep wall, forcing Rag to respond. In the bottom, in the meantime, four members of Heroes of Lobe League here. There's a lot of indecision. They're, it just looks like they're not quite sure how to respond to the control that Pepperidge Farm Remembers has on the map. And Pepperidge Farm Remembers is keeping their cool, keeping the pressure on the top lane. The Haka is just hanging around bottom, waiting for his opportunity. In the meantime, his four teammates are just putting absolutely so much pressure on this top lane. What I would like to see happen here at some point, should Pepperidge Farm Remembers decide to do it, is switch these lane assignments. Put this four man in the bottom and take that bottom fort. And you can have the Haka here on the top. They are just absolutely bullying heroes of Overlay, pushing them back into their own keep. And it just seems like those health bars on the blue are always so low. Currently level seven to five. Even though nobody has died, uh, it's just been blue. Heroes of Overleg on their back foot this whole game. In the meantime, Arthas still getting bullied by the Haka, and it looks like the Haka is going to secure the satellite uplink. Arthas is going to tr go to try to go in and stop him, but there's the stun, the drag, and Arthas is in a lot of trouble here. He's hanging out, doesn't want to give it up. In the end, the Haka secures it, and the pressure continues to mount on the top keep. Sylvanas and the Black Arrow is doing a lot of work. Once again, Ragnaros forced to pop Molten Core just as like a pressure valve. He just has to use it to force the other team back. Pepperidge Farm remembers just putting so, so much map pressure on, and they're on the verge of securing a 100 to 0 Zerg wave. The Haka was forced back here. Strong rotation from Heroes of Overleague. Pepperidge Farm Remembers is really, really controlling this game. Doug Funny on Dahaka has been very patient, has had really good map awareness, not overstepping his bounds. He gets the satellite when he can. He backs up when he can't. And now we have, for the first time, two members down here with Dahaka, while all five of Heroes of Overleague are down here. And now they're leaving. I'm not 
quite sure what they're trying to do here. In the meantime, Pepperidge Farm, remember, is trying to an aggressive invasion. Rhaegar has sniffed it out. However, nobody from Heroes of Overleaf has arrived. Arthas is trying to sneak the top satellite uplink. He will get sniffed out by Sylvanas, and he will have to retreat. Although, maybe a good break for them. They did catch Malph out. However, Zarya shields and a nice green lawn from Malfurion. He's able to get out safely. Heroes of Overleaf now has a 4 on 4. Vala just soaks so much damage from Gul'dan. However, they are able to force Pepperidge Farm members off the satellite uplink, doing everything they can to hold on to it. However, their main damage, Vala, had to hurt back. She was too low. And the poison is going to finish off Rhaegar unless he gets a heal. He does get the heal. Pepperidge Farm remembers is on the offensive. Heroes of Overleaf has to retreat. They were able to secure 60% of the Zerg wave, which is a, a, a small victory for them because at least they won't get 100 to 0. Rhaegar does finally fall, and it looks like Rag will as well. So first two kills of the game going to Pepperidge Farm remembers. And this is most certainly going to be a 100 to 60 Zerg rush in favor of Pepperidge Farm Remembers. And not only that, Pepperidge Farm Remembers is going to secure their tens basically right as this Zerg wave spawns. And they have all members uh, except for Gul'dan. So Gul'dan was going to defend top for Pepperidge Farm Remembers while all four of his teammates push bottom. We have Horrify for Gudan, Expulsion Zone for Zarya, Wailing Arrow for Sylvanas, Adaptation for Dahaka, and Twilight Dream for Malfurion. In the middle of that fight, Ragnaros did pop Molten Core, but with all the members of Red right there, they burned him down very quickly. He wasn't able to do too much uh, damage. Uh, Sylvanas, however, was killed in that defense, so that leaves this a 3-on-3. Three three. Johanna and Rhaegar are pushing against Gul'dan in the top lane. However, blue team, Heroes of Overlay, they really need their level 10 to try to even out this game. Dahaka taking a lot of damage, however, the Zarya Shield keeping him up. Nice root by Arthas. Pressure still staying from Pepperidge Farm remembers. However, that's, that Sylvanas' death really stunted this offense in the bottom lane, and they will now clean up the Zerg. Meanwhile, in the top lane, Dahaka burrowed, and he missed his drag. Now they're trying to body block Rhaegar. There's the expulsion zones and the roots, and they are able to catch out Rhaegar. Another pick for Pepperidge Farm remembers. Now up in levels 12 to 9. Heroes of Overleague right now on the verge of getting their 10s. However, an aggressive boss call. They figure with Heroes of Overleague being forced to do lane maintenance. Now is a great time to burn down the boss, and it looks like it will be a good call. They do have the scouting zone able to see any advance from them. However, the boss will go uncontested. Heroics for Heroes of Overleague. Reign of Vengeance for Vala. Ancestral Healing for Rhaegar. Lava Wave for Ragnaros. Summon Sindragosa for Arthas. Johanna still undecided. Bosch pushing in the top lane. Keep in mind, this is the lane where they already have the walls down. They already have about half the health down on the peak. Four members, including Sylvan, is going to push with this boss. Boss is going to force a full defense from Heroes of Overleague. The silence onto Rag prevents him from doing the Molten Four. Great Wailing Arrow by Flava Flav, and that will definitely confirm this top fort, preventing Rag from going Molten Four and securing Ragnarok's death. There's the Horrify and Expulsion Zone, securing the Arthas kill. Heroes of Overleaf in trouble. Vala on the retreat, Ragnaros on the retreat. All five members of Pepperidge Farm are members marching toward the core at 10 minutes and 24 seconds. Their boss at about half health. I don't know if they'll quite have enough to take this core down. It's going to be tight. Heroes of Overleaf really needs to get in there. Core down to 65. Down now below 50%. Blessed Shield finally selected by Johanna. This is going to be GG at 10 minutes and 46 seconds. Pepperidge Farm remembers. Wins the game. Advances their record to 2-1. and one. Heroes of Overleague falls to 1-2. and two. 
a very dominant performance by Pepperidge Farm members. They had a very clear idea of how they wanted to manage that map, and uh, Heroes of Overly just were never able to get off the back foot the whole game. They just seemed to be constantly responding to pressure from Pepperidge Farm members and just couldn't quite seem to find the adjustment to get themselves back on even footing. So a very quick game, uh, from a very quick win for Pepperidge Farms, remembers. And now we have about 20 minutes or so before our game four. Good game, good win for Pepperidge Farm, remembers. Our next game will feature two undefeated Division Three teams, both currently at 2-0. and We have the Lords of Exodar and Avalanche. So we do have a little bit of time to kill here. Let me go ahead and record the score for that last game. Pepperidge Farm remembers taking the win. So pretty entertaining games here uh, so far, and I, I do expect this last one to be the best of the bunch, so hopefully we'll go out of our Division Three Chair League of Palooza uh, with our best game of the night. Both teams trying to stay undefeated and at the top of Division Three, and uh, qualify for the Division Three playoffs. Of course, all of the divisions in Chair League do have playoffs at the end of the regular season. Season four is an eight-game season, this being uh, game three uh, of the eight-week season. So let's see if there's anybody in the game lobby yet, and it looks like there are. So I'm going to take about a two-minute quick little break here uh, before we get the next game going, and then we will start our next game uh, here in about five minutes, I hope. We will be right back. Told you it would be a quick break. We are already here. We are in the lobby. Both teams raring to go. 
Uh, I love it when both teams are on time. That's fantastic. And both teams uh, willing to start a little early too, which is great because now we don't have to uh, <coughs> don't have to have a delay for the uh, viewers, which is fantastic. So our fourth and final game of tonight will be on Tomb of the Spider Queen. Like I mentioned before, a little break there. Both of these teams are 2-0 and and trying to stay undefeated and at the top of the chair league standing. So I'm hoping that this will be our best game of the evening. Tomb of the Spider Queen is one of the smaller maps uh, in the game. It's also... <laughs> it's also... Uh, it's probably the small, not probably, it is the smallest three-lane map in the game. And it allows you, uh, just by the design of the map, to move between lanes really, really quickly. So wave clear is really prioritized here. This is probably the battlefield where a global is least prioritized. Uh, so wave clear and being able to catch people out in those rotations from lane to lane are really important. This is another good map for Kael'thas, Johanna as well. It's also one of the more snowball-y maps because if you get ahead and you control the lanes, it becomes very difficult for the other team to turn in all of their gems. And if you can control those turn-in points, um, the, the other team starts accumulating all of these gems on their heroes and and they get a little hesitant you, you don't want to lose a big team fight and drop a hundred gems that's uh, feels bad man so uh it's really important on tomb of the spider queen to have a strong early game and kind of take control of the map since those turn-ins are right in the middle of the map you want to uh, get that first turn in if you can and snowball it from there push those lanes out and get vision on those turn-in points so it's impossible for your opponent to control uh, th those places. So both teams just uh, doing some bios and wrapping up. Hey, what's going on? I, I, I don't know, how, Agteb? <laughs> Every time I see you, I just... Uh, uh, I, I butcher the name, I'm sure. But uh, welcome back to the stream. Hope you enjoy our last game of the evening here. Had some pretty good games. Last one... Uh, went pretty quick, so like I mentioned, I'm really happy when players in the next game are raring to go, they're on time, and ready to jump straight in the game. Uh, it really keeps downtime down on the stream, which is which is what we want, you know, just roll right in the next game, get some more Hear League, Hero, Hero League, Chair League, Heroes of the Storm games in. Looks like they are almost ready. So both of these teams are new to Chair League this season. So good to see we have some uh, fans of Lords of the Exodar in there. <laughs> and it looks like some fans of Avalanche as well. Waiting on one last person, I believe, from uh, Avalanche, although now it looks like they're here. So uh, we're going to get this draft started here uh, right now. I can't stress enough how much more seamless the integrated draft within the client is and how much easier it makes for both players and casters to not have to worry about alt tabbing out to some other third party site and links and then starting a lobby. Just it, it saves time and effort and, and less glitches to um, even being able to be in the lobby with the opponents if something goes wrong without having to alt tab into uh, All tab into Heroes to Talk is uh, is nice too. 
Also, you don't have to wait for the third-party sites to add new heroes. They're automatically added. So uh, good times. Still haven't seen a Lucio today. Uh, we did see a Lucio ban last game, and we did see a murky pick first game. Uh, so hoping uh, to see a Lucio now, I think, would be fun. I've heard pretty good reviews of him, and his win rate is pretty good. So surprised we haven't seen uh, more more um, surprised we just haven't seen more Lucio today. Lords of the Exodar, first pick, first ban, currently on the clock. Uh, tomb, you might see a Ragnaros ban. Uh, Artanis uh, has been killing it tonight uh, on our chair league games. So maybe an Artanis ban. Sylvanas really helps the Spider Queen's push. So you could see Syl uh, banned out as well. <clears throat> Kael'thas, always good. Um, maybe Lucio. We'll see. Uh, the, I, I really like the position the meta is in right now. While a couple of heroes, I think, could use a little, tur uh, a little tuning. By and large, most of the heroes are viable in some form, even if they're just niche. So um, really a lot of different options, a lot of different comps you can put together. And it will be Ragnaros, first band for Lords of the Exodar. It looks like we have both fans in the chat here. Always fun to see. <clears throat> Avalanche on the clock for their first ban of the game, and they banned Gul'dan. I didn't even mention Gul'dan, but he is excellent. He's just really good normally um, in really any comp on any map, but on battlefields where wave clear is, uh, is even more important than it normally is, he shines even brighter. Just like we saw on Braxa's last name, Gul'dan did a ton of work. He would also do a ton of work on Tomb here, so a nice ban by Avalanche. However, that does leave Artanis still available. And if Lords of the Exodar was watching any of our first two games, they saw just how game-changing those swaps can be if you can hit them. So maybe an Artanis first pick here. We'll see that from Lords of the Exodar. Still Lucio, Murky, Sylvanas. And there's the Sylvanas. The master skin Sylvanas selected by Lords of the Exodar. Now leaves two picks for Avalanche, and there's the Lucio. No hesitation, so we will get a Lucio in our game today. Last game of the night, and there's our Lucio. One more pick for Avalanche. Taking their time on this one. Really didn't hesitate on the Lucio. And there's Varian. Varian, you're seeing mostly taunt Varian because of the insane amount of point-and-click lockdown. However, Colossus Smash could be used in the right comp as well. <laughs> and Varian just had a switch where his level 13s and switch, uh, 16s were switched. <clears throat> so uh, now he can get his Juggernaut and Shattering Throw earlier. Lords of the Exodar. Going with ETC Malfurion, very straightforward, meta, strong composition so far for Lords of the Exodar. Avalanche going with kind of the new wave heroes, Varian and Lucio. They opt to ban Tychus, so you assume that they're getting a second tank to pair up with Varian, which would make sense. Lords of the Exodar now deciding on their second ban. There's a little bit of a debate on Reddit or wherever, or whether Lucio can solo heal. I've heard it both ways. So curious to see if Avalanche decides to solo heal uh, with Lucio, or whether they pair him up with kind of an off support, maybe like a Karazim, uh, Tyrande, or Tassadar. Uh, Lili, even Damage Lili can work in the right comp. Uh, probably not this one, though, because there's not really many auto attackers on the side of Lords of the Exodar. So many different options you can go. I mentioned this last game, when you select your tank and your healer early in the draft, it really doesn't let the other team know where you're going, and, and you have so many different options available to you, uh, so many different paths to go, go especially when you pick um, like ETC Mouth, doesn't just give anything away, so you can really go anywhere with that. Lords of the Exit are responding, their second ban, 
will be Vala. And now Avalanche gets two choices to pair with their Lucio and Variant. Currently lacking uh, in wave clear, Lucio has very poor wave clear. Varian has very poor wave clear, so that's something I would like to see them address here. Kael'thas is, is good for that. Uh, if the second tank they wanted was Johanna, she's good for that. Or Dahaka, if they wanted to go Dahaka second tank, uh, is good for that as well. Jaina also out there. Uh, also, the Jaina selection would keep her from ETC Mouth. Jaina pairs so well with ETC and Malfurion in particular. Or Nazebo. Nazebo has excellent... Oh, wow. Doubled up on the ranged wave clear with Nazebo and Kael'thas. So they very quickly rectified the issue I had with their composition thus far, which is the lack of clear because Nazebo and Kael'thas both clear very well. I would imagine Avalanche's last pick is going to be some kind of tank to help protect the squishier backline. Last two picks for Lords of the Exodar. Uh, we're going to see some ranged assassin, I would imagine. They don't have one yet. And maybe a second off tank, or maybe two ranged assassins. Uh, they could go all kinds of different ways here. A second support, uh, even if they wanted to. Uh, melee assassin. Uh, Sonya, Thrall, both available still. Uh, Artanis, still on the board as well. You could do the Artanis swap into ETC Malfurion. Uh, is Jaina still out there? Li Ming, still out there. Lunara, still available. Murky, still sitting out there if they wanted to go Murky Merc. Lords of the Exit are taking it right down to the wire, and they go with the Li Ming Thrall. So a very straightforward, traditional comp uh, from Lords of the Exodar. And Avalanche rounds off their composition with a Johanna. So uh, we go from weak wave clear to nothing but wave clear. For Avalanche, Johanna, Kael'thas, Nazebo, all clear exceptionally well. Nice drafts by both teams. Uh, really going to come down to how well they execute, specifically with their rotations. Um, Avalanche is going to have an advantage in clearing and rotating. Because of Kael'thas and Johanna, they can really clear and rotate very quickly. And... That's not something that Lords of the Exodar has um, in their comp available to them. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see um, how they do that. Usually uh, on Tomb, you're going to have a solo lane bottom with a rotation between mid and top. Uh, in this particular case, I would expect like Nazebo to be the solo lane for Avalanche and Thrall, of course, to be the solo lane for Lords of the Exodar. And that would be an interesting matchup to watch, but the, the four-man, uh, definitely the advantage would fall to Avalanche, um, even with a pre-10 Varian, because Varian is, of course, very weak before level 10, and he gets his heroic. And we are officially underway on our last game of the evening. Blue team, Boards of the Exodar, we have... Rosai, Rosai on Sylvanas, Mega Zergling on Li Ming, Dunkirk, nope, Dunrick on Malfurion, Matt Cathon on Thrall, and Hargon on ETC. On the red team, Avalanche, we have Quans on Nazebo, Skeptic on Kael'thas, Like Men on Lucio, Renor on Varian, and Bulgy on Johanna. Both teams charging to the mid lane, ready to hear the clash of arms and the casting of spells. However, Lords of the Exodar opts to dance around their gate instead. And Lucio does eat a wolf, but that's really about it. Both teams posturing. No initiation by anybody. And now we have some skirmishing as the lanes arrive. And there's that clear I was talking about. Look how fast... Johanna and Kael'thas just melted that wave, and there they go, back to the top lane. Nazebo is already in the bottom, and this is going to be the early test for Lords of the Exodar. They don't have... Look, look at how fast they are. They're already behind. Kael'thas and Johanna, they burn so quickly they have to wait for this bottom wave. 
In the meantime, looks like Nazebo is getting the better of Thrall. Thrall shouldn't lose this lane too hard, and if he can catch Nazebo, he can definitely put the hurt on him. However, ETP tries to initiate there. It's a counter stun charge from Varian. Lots of damage going out. Johanna's condemned, not quite able to finish it off. And back to the rotation they go. This is uh, one of the areas where these AoE healers like uh, Lucio and Brightwing can excel is between fights they can just top off their teammates so well and you can see it right here they're just already full and ready to go on to the next team fight whereas that's not something that Malfurion can do top off his teammates in rotation instead. three man power slide from ETC counter charge and counter attack from Avalanche ETC will retreat and Avalanche will continue with their quick aggressive rotations Sylvanas almost gets caught out, but he's able to get away. The uh, little skirmish there in the mid lane did allow Avalanche to miss actually a wave of soak here, though. In the bottom wave, it continues to be largely a draw with maybe a slight advantage to Nazebo. Looks like Avalanche has fallen out of their rotation just a little bit, and now they get it back together. Johanna and Kael'thas, the two of those on Tomb of the Spider Queen, just uh, clear so quickly. Party bush here for Avalanche. If anybody shows up, they will ambush them or they will just clear this way very quickly. Both teams dead even in XP, despite the fact that Lords of the Exodar is a little bit behind in the rotations. However, I spoke too soon. They rotated on Nazebo with Malfurion and ETC, and that is a big win for Lords of the Exodar because now they have to rotate Johanna down here, and that weakens the four-man. Kael'thas can still clear it pretty quickly, however, they will be at a disadvantage, and Varian 310 just isn't a tank, and that's exactly what we see there. They got aggressive onto Lucio. He is able to get away, but a ton of damage went down on him, and Thrall rotating up from the bottom. So, um, Lords of the Exit are not content to sit there and let Avalanche control these lanes, they're moving around the map and putting pressure on the rotations of Avalanche, making sure they have to pay attention to the map. Still though, only one kill of the game. It was the Nazebo pick. Both teams pretty dead even. I mean, about as close as you can get in XP. And the lost gems by Nazebo is really the only difference. Lords of the Exodar has the gems to turn in here in a minute. ETC did try to initiate onto Kael'thas, but his team was too far away, and then Johanna and Varian just body blocked him in the vents right there. However, ETC's death did buy enough time for his teammates to get the turn in, and the first web weavers of the game will go to Lords of the Exodar. And let's see how this is defensed. So after this defense, Avalanche will certainly have enough to turn in. They are set up here for defense. It looks like they're going to prioritize the top lane, so we're going to have a 4-on-4 four four with Wave Push. Avalanche needs to be a little bit careful till Varian gets to 10. That's a, such a huge power spike for him at 10. And before he gets there, he is uh, a little bit vulnerable and can offer a little bit less to his team. But Johanna and Varian... Um, Bulgy and Eranor are doing a really good job of just providing a solid front line for Lucio and Kael'thas and, and soaking up all that damage and that uh, protected that uh, Varian took at 4 instead of the stun. He's gotten a lot of mileage out of that. Typically you see the Warbringer after 4, or at level 4, he opted instead for the shield wall, is that what it's called? Yes, he opted instead for Shield Wall, and he's made really good use out of that. I assume he picked that specifically for the Lee Ming, because he can just put himself in front of those orbs, pop his W, and eat all of that damage. So really nice adjustment by Irinor on the Varian there. So only the mid sport wall goes down. Great defense by Avalanche, and once again, we return to a very close game. Avalanche, though, does have a turn-in, and they're trying to get it here. 
I don't think Lord of the Exodar will allow them to, and they don't. Uh, Nazebo and Thrall both resuming their one-on-one -on -one battle at the bottom lane. Those two will be boxing all game long. We'll try to check in with them in a minute once this little skirmish goes. Uh, Varian taking a lot of damage, and it looks like they're going to try to rotate onto Thrall as Nazebo has been getting a little bullied. Thrall does not quite sniff it out. Eats a lot of damage with the Living Bomb, but able to get away with the movement speed. But now Varian is caught out with the face melt. He is able to walk away by using his shield wall. However, Avalanche is able to secure their first turn in of the game, and this has turned into a full-on brouhaha. Both teams having almost all members involved. A lot of damage, a lot of abilities, and nobody falls on either side. Avalanche is going to put a lot of pressure in this bottom lane, pushing it with this web weaver right here. And uh, I imagine if they manage to secure this uh, top, uh, I'm sorry, this bottom wall, uh, they will probably rotate to the next one up. It's pretty hard to get ports um, on the first turn in, so a lot of teams will just try to get the wall and then move on. And it looks like that's what Avalanche is going to do. I think that's a good decision. Yes, Andrew, I probably will be playing after the stream. Move up to mid fort where the wall is already down. I would like to see them prioritize the fountain here. If you can get those fountains, uh, if you can get the fountain, it gives you a big advantage um, as you can move around the map. I will check those talents for you, Anson. Uh, let me get a little downtime here in a second. So both bottom and mid web weavers are cleaned up, and it looks like Avalanche will let this top one go as it is almost down already. Uh, Lucio has opted for we move together, chase the base, sonic amplifier, and sound barrier. Now let's go over our level 10s. We really didn't have a chance to do that. In the middle of that turn in, both teams picked up their level 10s. We have Phoenix for Kael'thas, Blessed Shield for Johanna, Sound Barrier for Lucio, Taunt for Varian, and Gargantuan for Nazebo. For Lords of the Exodar, Wailing Arrow for Sylvanas, Disintegrate for Li Ming, Twilight Dream for Malfurion, Save Dive for ETC. I would assume that's because of all of the stuns available to get rid of the Mosh Pit, and Earthquake for Thrall, holding until just a minute ago. This is a really even game. Both teams have one turn in. Neither team has been able to get a fort. Both teams have one kill. Both teams almost identical. However, in level, Sylvanas is caught out and absolutely destroyed by Avalanche. A good pick there. Now they do have a little 5 on 4 advantage. Varian charges in on ETC. He power slides away. Johanna uses that speed boost to get out in front of uh, Malfurion. There's the stage dive in for the counter engage. Lots of damage with the living bomb and the uh, <coughs> convection in the tight spaces. But Thrall is the first to go down. ETC exploded by Kael'thas shortly after. That was a nice counter engage there from Lords of the Exodar. However, anytime you fight in tight corridors like that against the Kael'thas, he does so much work, and that's just not an area where you can take a fight against Kael'thas due to all of that living bomb damage and his flame strike damage because he did a ton of work in that fight. Um, and you could see, I don't know if you guys saw it, but on that initiation, the speed boost on Johanna just allowed her to race car right ahead of Malfurion and try to get the body block ahead for the initiation. So well played by Avalanche. It nets them about a one level advantage and they do have turn in. They're trying to secure their second turn in of the game. Nice disintegrate um, by Li Ming. However, she eats a blessed shield, a stun and a taunt and loses 32 gems. ETC does manage to pick up most of them with a nice power slide. However, Avalanche on the full offensive Thrall down to 65 hit points before he's able to get away. Mouth being chased by Kael'thas on the bottom. However, it looks like only Li Ming will lose her life, uh, trading the stall for that death. So Avalanche gaining a little bit of a mid-game advantage. They also did get the turn in on the back of that. And now a little bit over a level ahead, about a level and a half ahead. And this is 
uh, the place where it can be dangerous for Lords of the Exodar, uh, particularly on uh, Tomb of the Spider Queen, which, as I mentioned, can get a little snowball -y. So they are certainly in a little bit of a danger zone here. They'd like to get a team fight win if they can. Uh, now, Fury and ETC need to be very careful, holding on to almost 50 gems between them. Avalanche, happy with their uh, mid-keep wall takedown, now rotate to the top lane. This top lane is probably the most important lane on Tomb of the Spider Queen because it's the lane the boss pushes down, and the boss is definitely one of the win conditions for Tomb of the Spider Queen. So rotate to the top lane. This keep wall will go down. ETC stage dives directly onto the Spider Queen and gets surrounded in zombies for his trouble. Wailing Arrow goes out and hits two. Avalanche does not care. The charge and the taunt. ETC eating a ton of damage. He needs to get out of there with his 30 gems. However, Sylvanas goes down on the backside. Once again, Avalanche able to secure a team fight win, and they are going for more. No mercs here to eat this keep damage, so this could be a little dicey. But they really want this keep. Aggressive power slide by ETC onto Lucio, and that's a big pick for Lords of the Exodar. It gets Lucio off the map, gives Le Leeming resets. However, ETC drops a lot of gems, but Mega Zerling on Leeming shows no fear and dives right in to get them. Great follow-up route by Thrall. Varian could be in trouble. Can Leeming pick him off? No, the zombie wall eats the Leeming damage, and Varian gets away with 46 hit points. So a nice counter engage on the side of Lords of the Exodar, able to get the pick on Lucio. However, ETC had to trade uh, for that death as well. Now a two level advantage for Avalanche, as well as the first keep of the game down. Uh, convection I'm sure is done, and yes it is. Right now Avalanche most certainly in control of this map. It looks like Lords of the Exit are trying to sneak in a turn in. This would be huge if they could. It's going to be close. Great face melt by ETC. Most certainly allowed Mega Zergling to turn in, and that is their second turn in. Johanna trying to initiate two-man Wailing Arrow. Varian diving in on the Thrall. A flanking Leeming trying to get some damage on, and then a Twilight Dream Silence as well. But this Avalanche team is just constant forward motion. They have no fear charging in. <laughs> yes, yeah, snowball-y like an avalanche. Very good. <laughs> so <laughs> avalanche showing absolutely no hesitation. Just full speed straight ahead. Sounded the cavalry charge and drove Lords of the Exodar all the way back to their keep before they finally withdrew and started to clean up these web leaders. So far, Lords of the Exodar just has not been able to get something going. Now, Furion is isolated out and goes down there. Earthquake maybe popped a little late. It might have been on cooldown. Thrall goes down too. This lockdown between Varian and Kael'thas. Combined with the speed of Lucio is just allowing Avalanche to take any engagement they want and disengage from anything they don't want. So, and they picked and chose their battle so well. Really controlled this game from about 10 minutes in till now. Unfortunately, that turning wasn't able to be much. So, Vana caught out of position and in front, and there she goes. Taunt Varian once again locking down another victim, and Sylvanas unfortunately is picked off right as her teammates spawn, and that is another 30 seconds where Lords of the Exodar will be down a man, and Avalanche heading to the throw pit where they will try to secure the box. This is a best of one. It looks like Lords of the Exodar is not going to contest this, and that's probably a wise move. Level 18 to level 15 down a man. However, with no keep in the top lane, Lords of the XR needs to send all members of their team to defend this because this is going to walk straight to their core. Unfortunately for Avalanche, they don't quite have enough for turn in, but I think what they're going to do is they're going to clear these waves, get enough gems, and then do another turn in while Lords of the XR is forced to deal with this boss. 
So Avalanche not taking their foot off the gas at all and just applying constant pressure uh, on the map. You wonder if maybe they would have chosen to push with the boss instead, but nice defense by Lords of the Exodus. They burn down that boss before it does any damage on the core itself. However, with a level 18 to level 15 advantage and Web Weavers moving in, this is going to be at least one maybe two keeps and lords of the exit are certainly in trouble a great zoning phoenix from skeptic on kale um, they know that this mid keep is going down they're content just to have their presence ensure that this keep falls lords of the exit are doing their best to cope in defense um, however fighting three levels down is very difficult this is the spot they want to fight in though 16 to 19 this is going to be the closest thing they get to an even fight both teams are on even talent tiers that mid keep does fall and it looks like avalanche is going to pull the bottom web weavers in and try to completely clean the map eliminating any fortifications from Swords of the Exodar. There's the stage dive into there. Now they're trying to initiate with the Earthquake. Mouth is deleted as is Lucio. Thrall, I'm sorry, Thrall goes down as does Lucio. A one for one so far. Li Ming trying so hard to get a reset. And Naz and Varian and Kael'thas are so low. So a small break for Lords of the Exodar. And that was, look at how close this was to a massive team fight win. That was good timing for, for that engagement. They knew that that was the time to pick a fight. They did win their first team fight of the game, two for one, but had one or two things gone a little bit differently, that could have easily been a four for one if Leaning had gotten one reset there. Who knows how that goes? However, Avalanche still definitely in control of this game. All of their structures are up while Lords of the Exodar is down to one quarter strength keep. So Lords of the Exodar needs to start taking team fights. Otherwise, they're going to really be pinned up in their base the whole game. So they should try to stall out as long as they can. They're not going to get a pick on Johanna, who's at level 20. They want to do everything they can to keep this game alive until level 20, and then maybe win a couple team fights. That's how Lords of the Exodar gets back into this game. But one more team fight loss, and uh, it'll certainly be curtains uh, on the side of Lords of the Exodar. But they're not done yet. They're hanging around, clinging to this game with everything they have. Rotating between lanes, trying to gather up as much experience as possible. And hopefully they can get to 20 before they're forced to take their next team fight. Luckily for them, Avalanche is not anywhere near a turn in. So as long as they rotate around safely, um, they should be able to soak some XP and hopefully uh, stay out of trouble and get their level 20. And then we'll have the game deciding team fight, I imagine. Very smart. And this is a really smart move by Avalanche. They saw Lords of the Exodar still in the top lane, and they just went in and simply eliminated the last fortification on the map. Really good map awareness and decision making by Avalanche. Um, I, it's going to take two or three solid team fight wins here for Lords of the Exodar to win this game, and then we have Avalanche sitting here waiting for a party bush. They're waiting for Lords of the Exodar to try to take this Merc camp and see if they can end the game. This is going to be interesting. I don't think Lords of the Exodar has any idea where they're at, and they're showing that discretion is the better part of Valor. They want no part of any ambush, and they wisely withdraw. Good patience shown there by both teams, actually, uh, by Avalanche to see if they could get a game-winning ambush, and by Lords of the Exodar not to walk into a bad situation and just continuing to do what they're doing which is bounce back and forth between lanes, soak the XP, and do everything they can to get to 20. So they want to get to 20, win a team fight, and turn in, win a team fight, and get a boss, and, and then see where it goes from there. It's, it's a long shot for sure, but not something we haven't seen before. Avalanche tired of dancing around the map, and they go straight to the boss. Lords of the Exodar, I don't think, can respond to this. They have Katas on core. 
They're maneuvering up there. I assume they're going to have ETC stage dive in, but it is going to be too late. Lords of the Exodar, no, it's too late. And Thrall is, oh, very far forward. There's the stage dive on the backside, however. The Blessed Shield is ETC too far away. Leeming and Mouth were blown up, absolutely blown up. And this game is most definitely over. Uh... I'm not quite on the same page from Lords of the Exodar there. When ETC st stage dived, he was a little far back and it left Leeming and Malfurion exposed and they ate full fury of Avalanche with an excellent initiation and a great blessed shield from Bulgy on Johanna. So Avalanche takes our final game of the night. They will increase their record to 3-0. and they will stay at the top of Division 3 with their undefeated record. Lords of the Exodar fall to 2-1, and one, still having a solid season, but they will look to bounce back next week. Really well played by Avalanche. It was a close game until, uh, until the keep started falling. Lords of the Exodar did everything they could to try to get to 20 and try to make something out of it. Uh, however, Avalanche didn't make a mistake. They didn't... Uh, give Lords of the Exodar a chance to get back in that game. And when you're kind of down in that situation, a lot of the times it comes down to the team that's ahead making a poor decision or getting picked off. But Avalanche never did that. And uh, unfortunately, Lords of the Exodar, for them, were not able to come back. So that's it, guys. Thanks for joining me for our Division Three Chair League of Palooza Thursday night. Four entertaining games today. House of Chez. Uh, coming away with a victory in Game 1. Uh, forget about it, coming away with a victory in Game 2. Pepperidge Farm remembers coming away with a victory in Game 3. And Lords of the Exodar in Game 4. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I will be back next week casting some more Chair League. I also do a Monday Night Replay Analysis stream um, for uh, lower-level Here League players uh, specifically. So if you know someone or that's something that you're interested in, fire me a uh, replay. Uh, feel free to reach out to me around the Nexus. Have a wonderful night, everybody. Take care.